a keynote address from a woman who has uh, made a very strong, established a very strong footprint in our business world and in the, her passion for transformation, her passion for thinking differently. And, and that is certainly something we all need to be doing now, as we've heard from Anne-Marie. We need to be thinking differently how we run our businesses, how we run our lives. And Margot Cairns is such a person who works with companies, with the boards of major companies around the world, to help them to think differently, out of the square, laterally, and then to behave differently. It's all very well thinking differently, but to transform their behavior and the way they go about doing business and therefore their performance. She works um, with companies such as uh, oil companies, Alcoa, Telstra, and a whole range of large companies. She also has a, a very interesting um, set of interests. She happens to, if anybody wants a yoga class, I mean, here we are. Margot Cairns is a yoga teacher, and if you happen to be going to Byron Bay in the next couple of months, uh, that's where Margot Cairns will be uh, pursuing her yoga uh, <laughs> talents, uh, uh, as well as being a mother and running a huge business. This is running anywhere between 100 to 300 percent growth per annum. So, without any further ado, Margot Cairns. Thanks, Rob, and welcome. We have a little film clip to show you. Look at the 10 hottest years ever measured. They've all occurred in the last 14 years. And the hottest of all was 2005. The scientific consensus is that we are causing global warming. I am Al Gore. I used to be the next president of the United States of America. This is Patagonia 75 years ago and the same glacier today. This is Mount Kilimanjaro, 30 years ago and last year. Within the decade, there will be no more snows of Kilimanjaro. This is really not a political issue so much as a moral issue. Temperature increases are taking place all over the world, and that's causing stronger storms. This is the biggest crisis in the history of this country. Early this morning, Hurricane Katrina slammed into New Orleans. Is it possible that we should prepare against other threats besides terrorists? From Paramount Classics comes a film that has shocked audiences everywhere they've seen it. The Arctic is experiencing faster melting. If this were to go, sea level worldwide would go up 20 feet. This is what would happen in Florida. Around Shanghai, home to 40 million people. The area around Calcutta, 60 million. Here's Manhattan. The World Trade Center Memorial would be underwater. Think of the impact of a couple hundred thousand refugees, and then imagine a hundred million. We have to act together to solve this global crisis. ability to live is what is at stake. I um, wanted to show you this clip, although a lot of you will have seen the movie, because it just reminds us of an issue that is really important to us all. If we look at the polls that have been recently done in Australia, we can see that, for example, the Lowy Institute poll in July told that the 68% believe global warming is a threat to our vital interests. The Nielsen poll done in October, 75% are prepared to pay more for the energy to help boost investment in renewables. Greenpeace, just a month later, 92% of Australians believe that the government is not doing enough on clean technology. 
91 per cent want to see a shift away from coal power, sorry, coal fired power stations. 79 per cent believe the government is wrong not to sign Kyoto. We're at a time in our history where we have to work together if we are to have a future. What the Gore film does is it echoes the zeitgeist of our time. We care about our planet. We care about our lifestyle. We care about the future of our children. We are prepared to pay more to preserve it and we are not happy with how leadership is currently handling this situation. So what does all this have to do with corporate social responsibility? Well, if we listen to Al Gore, if we cross a point of no return, the process of degradation would be irretrievable. I put it to you that corporate social responsibility is about planetary sustainability and corporate sustainability. You see, having global um, sea levels go up, can we have the next one here? Global sea levels go up 20 feet is bad business. Having 100 million refugees is bad business. Having the political unrest that will be caused by the sorts of things that are going to come out of global warming is really bad business. Drought and wildfires are bad business. And yet, if we look at a 2006 Joint Committee uh, presentation, Corporations and Financial Services report, we find that most Australian businesses, while they're good at making money, have little regard for their environment and little regard for the communities that sustain them. So then we have corporate social responsibility. Now I'm going to be contentious and give you my personal opinion and that is that most corporate social responsibility is shallow, self-serving, cosmetic, PR-driven and about do-gooding. So what does that mean? Well, if we listen to what Anne-Marie said and what Rob said, it has to be deep in the culture of the corporation. It has to be not just about the program we do here or there, but how we live every single day, how we make every single decision. There was an interesting article in the Harvard Business Review this month about Walmart, which are doing all these corporate social responsibility programs, and somebody found a, an email that went through the company about how they weren't going to employ any sick people. And if anyone was found to be sick, they would be gotten rid of in a variety of ways. And this hit the press. So all the good things that were happening because of the nice programs out there totally counteracted by what was actually happening and lived every single day. What I'm going to do with you this morning is to share a couple of stories. And one is the story of a big, smelly, polluting organisation that deeply believed in corporate social responsibility. And it used its deep belief in corporate social responsibility to become a huge financial success. So the point that I'll be making through this whole speech is what is good for the community and corporate social responsibility is good for business. They are totally intertwined. And if we think that we can go off and do a few programs here and there and that's going to make a difference, well, it just isn't. <laughs> and actually, it's bad business. Really good business is deeply living this concept of Gandhi. You have to be the change you want to see in the world. And when corporations start doing that, the financial rewards are superlative. And we'll see that through a couple of case studies. So the first one is Pazminko. In August 2001, Greg Gailey was appointed the Managing Director of Pasminka. They had huge financial difficulties caused by heavy debt and hedging. They had a horrific, it was a really horrific environmental legacy. Some of their smelters, and they do lead and zinc, some of their smelters had been pumping lead into the environment for over 100 years through dust and air and soil pollution. They had a totally demotivated workforce and a culture that was described at the top as hub and spoke. 
and elsewhere basically <laughs> anarchy. So what happened was in the head office, the managing director had this policy he was the middle and he would just talk to people in ones and the sites were sort of geographically dispersed so they just did what they liked. Um, and this was the culture that led to the company um, having these financial difficulties. In September, uh, which was a month after Greg arrived, Pazminko went into a voluntary administration. They had a debt of $3.2 billion owed to 36 different financiers. And you might remember that ANSET went into administration at the same time. You might remember, at least I remember quite horrifically, you know, driving up to Sydney Airport during that period and seeing all the ANSET workers standing outside Terminal 3. Um, and just, you know, it's a horrific feeling for me of all these people losing their jobs. No Australian company the size of Pasminko has ever gone into administration and come out until now. And Greg made some decisions. He decided that the company would come out of administration. It would build the basis of being a world-class company once it was floated and it would create breakthrough levels of safety and environmental sustainability. I have to tell you, sitting in the workshops with Greg when he was telling his people these things, they thought he was cracked. I mean, they owe $3.2 billion. They're in administration. This is called going out the door backwards. And the man's sitting there saying, we're going to become a world-class company and we're going to make sure that we have safety. We are, nobody will be harmed by anything that we do. Our environmental levels are appalling. And people would look at him and say, well, wait a minute, we've got to make money. And he'd say, and? And? <laughs> and that's what corporate, corporate social responsibility is about. It's about this and. Because if we only have little problems, in other words, making a bit more money, we have no incentive to think at a different level. If we put in the real cost of doing business, the real nature of business, we have to think in a breakthrough way. And when we start to think in a breakthrough way, all sorts of things become possible. So how did Greg go about this? Well, firstly, he decided that <laughs> he would put all his senior people into a leadership development program which would be linked into the business. In other words, if he wanted them to think in this breakthrough way, he was going to have to train them to do it. And again, sitting in the workshops, people would say, we've got no money and you're exploring this expensive Zephyr to come and help us. Are you nuts? And he said, well, wait a minute, if we're going to do all of these things, we have to invest. And that's as important, what we do in the environment, what we, how we live our lives, how we work with communities is as important as making money. And you'll see in a little while that there's some very good reasons why he was saying that. At the same time as he was putting in this leadership development program, he closed smelters such as Cockle Creek that were not sustainable. Again, this took large arguments, in fact, with the financiers because to close a smelter means you actually have to deal with the environmental legacy. This costs millions at a time when a company looked like it didn't have millions to spend. But again, Greg was very clear. We have to do this. This is part of being a good corporate citizen. This is good strategic business. Levels of safety were raised across all the plants, um, the mines and the smelters. Um, early on, um, there was a fatality uh, in one of the smelters and I don't know if any of you have been involved in a large engineering company or any company where there's been a fatality. But I have to tell you, it is a heart-wrenching experience for everybody. And that was a big driver. How are we going to think about this differently? How are we going to do this differently? And it was also about building, Greg also decided to build community around the, the mines and the smelters. I don't know if you remember, but um, it was, I don't know, maybe 18 months ago, two years ago now, um, there was a sit-in at Century Mine and uh, guards with guns came to protect the mine from the Aboriginal communities around the mine um, who felt that they were not being well treated. 
And that was a big wake-up call for Zinefix. They sat back and they said, what are we doing wrong? These are our neighbours. These are our community. How do we work with this differently? Now, 20% of the workers at Century Mine are from the local Indigenous community. Found a completely different way of looking at it. So, what did all this lead to? Well, in April 2004, Zinefex was, limited, was listed with a modest debt, less than $200 million. In December 2005, the AFR listed Zinefex as the best growth stock on the ASX 100. In August 2006, Zinefex announced a $1.1 billion profit and even adjusted for record zinc prices. This is a world's best practice result. By choosing to do it all, they did everything miraculously. And they did it through the people. They did it through relationships. They did it believing that as corporate citizens, doing the right thing would pay for everybody. I have to say they did it in the face of a lot of cynicism and a lot of criticism. But they did it. Now, when we look at world's best practice research, which many of you will be familiar with, so I won't take too long on it, which is the work of Jack Collins or Jim Collins. He changes his name every time he writes a book. We'll see that what they did was they followed the formula that worked. So what Jim Collins found was that if you look at companies which over a period of 60 years are six times more successful than the market and 15 times more successful than their nearest competitor, they followed a similar formula. For example, they had, they had a vision. Well, Greg had a huge vision. They had core values. Well, Greg had a huge core values. Level 5 leader, well, Greg was quite clearly a level 5 leader and just to remind you what a level 5 leader is, a level 1 leader is a high-performing individual. Think of Pat Rafter, Ian Thorpe, the kind of person that we in Australia make Australian of the Year. A level 2 leader is a good team player, our second level of God in Australia, our cricketers and footballers. A level three leader is at the coach of one of these teams. So it's a manager, somebody who can take an existing group within an existing framework and help them do a little bit better. Football coaches, tennis coaches, whatever. A level four leader, we probably know them all by name because they've got huge egos. They tend to be entrepreneurial or get to the top of big organisations. They employ large PR companies to make sure everyone knows who they are. And we know all of, all of that because of the PR and then we know all about them because their companies fail and their pictures appear on the front page of the paper. Level 5 leaders, however, you probably don't know who they are. I imagine, I mean, Greg has given me permission to talk about the company but if he thought I was here saying nice things about you, he'd curl up in a little ball and want to go away. They have huge humility. So the way Jim Collins talks about it, he says... When a level four leader succeeds, he looks in the mirror and he says, aren't I wonderful? And if he fails, he looks at his people and he says, look what they've done. When a level five leader succeeds, he looks at the, his people and he says, aren't they wonderful? And when he fails, he looks in the mirror and he says, what can I learn? What can I take out of this? So the interesting thing about the whole Zinefex story is the whole process was based on creating a culture that developed and supported Level 5 leaders. There were success measures, measures other than profitability. Profitability was not the main measure. Now, interesting with that, of course, you have to be profitable, don't you? Because you can't play the game if you're not making money. But I can remember Greg saying again and again and again, Yes, we have to make money and, and we can't destroy our environment. We can't alienate our communities. Our people need to have rest. We have to work with families. In two weeks from now, I'm working, or my company is working with the top team of Zinefex and we're spending half a day working with the spouses because the spouses have said, well, you're doing all this development. What about us? We want to come too very strong belief that it's not just about money. Capacity to continuously adapt and innovate around big, hairy, audacious goals. As I said before, if we don't have big, hairy, audacious goals, there's no reason to think differently. 
We can just do same old, same old, a little bit different. And once you add corporate social responsibility in there, once you add sustainability of the planet in there, we have big, hairy, audacious goals. And once we have big, hairy, audacious goals and we add our financial goals in there, they're very big, hairy and audacious. We have to change. And as Anne-Marie said, the technology is there. Not only is the technology there, the research is there to say that if we're not doing it, we're nuts. An ability to exist with paradox, this and. This is what Greg was doing all the time. And, and, and. I remember <laughs> I worked for many years with BP on a global level and um, you'd go into anyone with BP and they used to have what they called stretch targets. And you go up to them and you'd say, how are you? And they go, twing! And the answer to that is yes. The answer is yes. Because when we get to the point of ding, we come out of the box and we start to think differently and we start to behave differently. And when we stretch our brains and we start to think and behave differently, anything is possible. We can save this planet. We can make it a paradise. But we can't do it by doing same old, same old. We need a coherent, there was a, in Zinefex there was a cohesive and directed culture, supportive of excellence, innovation, creativity, controlled risk taking and experimentation. And the company, the community was the ultimate creation. People in Zinefex have been offered two to three times the amount they currently earn to go elsewhere. And they won't go. In the hottest mining market that I can remember, they won't go because they just love working there. It's a place they just want to be. Now, what's really interesting is that before Greg ever arrived at Pasminko, his, pre his predecessor had spent several million dollars putting all the company through a leadership program based on this research. Everything in this research was what they were already attempting to do. It led to overhedging, massive debt, administration and incredible environmental legacy. Why? Why did the same research used in two different ways lead to two totally different outcomes? So to explain that, I'd just like to show you this little model which was um, we've adapted from a guy called Ken Wilbur who's a, an international philosopher a very big thinker. And by looking at research in a whole range of fields, he said, okay, when there's change, social change, political change, educational change, what works and what doesn't? And he said, okay, well, if you see the change in all these fields over a long period of time that worked, you'll notice that it operates in all of these what he called four quadrants. The first quadrant is individual internal. It's who am I? What makes me up? How do I tick? How do I think? What are my belief systems? What drives me? Quadrant two is the individual external. So how do I behave? What are my skills? Quadrant three is the collective internal. What's the culture in the organisation, the society, the group? What are the values, the vision? What are the relationships? And quadrant four is the collective external. Strategies, policies, processes. And what Wilbur said is, you have to operate in all four quadrants simultaneously in an aligned way. Now I will put to you that the program that Zinefex went through before Greg got there they were doing this and they were doing this. They then went off and did some of that in a totally non-aligned way. So what they did was they appeared to be doing the right things. However, they got the wrong outcome. And I'd suggest to you that the program that Greg put through, which they called Zinefex Unlimited, concentrated very heavily over here. Every leader in the company went through a mentoring process and I'm not just talking about a to-do process. I'm talking about this is who I am process. This is what makes me tick. 
This is how I got to be me. This is what I believe. This is what blocks me. This is what motivates me. This is what I want to become and this is who I am becoming. It was a hugely intensive one-on-one program. Plus people were working in groups. How are we going to work our relationships differently? Actually telling each other the truth, actually getting the issues on the table and, exp- and, and talking them out at a very deep and personal level. But all of that, all of that was linked into the strategy. Every single senior person in that company had a breakthrough project and many of those breakthrough projects were around corporate social responsibility. So the whole thing was integrated. Each one of those four, and of course there were a whole lot of skills happening as well, there was a whole behavioural uh, skill-based thing happening at the same time, but it was all integrated and it was all driven from the top down, although there was huge autonomy at each, of the, each level down the organisation. So just to share with you one of the projects, um, one of the breakthrough projects, and this one was done at um, Port Pirie. And Port Pirie is a smelter in South Australia which has been there for 100 years. For 100 years, it's a lead smelter and once there is an issue with what we call lead in blood, it impairs the learning ability of children. Port Pirie has been belching lead into the environment of Port Pirie for 100 years. It's in the dirt that the children play with. It's in the air that the children breathe. And it had been an intractable problem. The lead in blood levels were way above what was acceptable on any national, international or moral scale. And it was an intractable problem. So this was the breakthrough project for the smelter leaders at Port Perry. How do we turn this around? So using what, you know, looking at themselves and how they operated, using all the things they'd learned in their Zinefex Unlimited process, including that process we saw before with the four quadrants. Somebody's phone. <laughs> um, and being very honest with people, sitting down and actually talking about themselves. They involved the people in the local community. They involved the EPA Environmental Protection Agency, they involved the local council, they involved state government ministers, they involved everyone they possibly could. They taught them the things that they themselves had learned in Zinefex Unlimited and they said, how do we solve this problem? They then went to the board of Zinefex and they said, we need $50 million. I was sitting in the board meeting when they made the decision that as a company, nobody would be harmed because of what they did. So the board looked at the figures, looked at the reality and they gave the $50 million. So what this whole process is about, it's about breakthrough thinking, obviously. It was based on relationship and a collaborative approach. But what it's about is by the year 2010, getting the levels below what is now the current standard on a global way for lead in blood. I mean, this was a huge breakthrough project because it's not been able to be solved for about 100 years. And again, it was just taking something on and thinking about it differently. So, um, I just quickly want to go through one other little theory thing for you before I get on to another story. Which, And this really is, again, a lot of the basis of what happened in, um, in Zinefex. And it's simply based on research that we now know about how the human brain works. And what it tells us is that 75% of the population are actually using their brains in a way that forces them or restricts them in the way they think. And what we know is that if we are thinking in these very restricted ways, we simply cannot solve the problems that are facing us. Einstein said... You cannot solve problems at the same level of thinking you were at when you created them. And what we know through the research of psychologists is that our current education system, our current media, encourages us to stay in this in-the-box thinking. And to just give you a little taste, the first is egocentric thinking, which is effectively adolescent thinking. Yeah, And 15% of the population are there. 60% of the population are at the next level and the next level is I get my whole sense of identity 
from what the world reflects back to me about myself. So if I feel liked and accepted and people agree with me, then I'm okay. But if I'm not, what happens? I fall apart. So we heard from Anne-Marie some of the statistics on what's happening in, in mental health. Basically, relationships are breaking down. People are having panic attacks. Depression is one of the major epidemics in our society. As people have socialised thinking are less and less capable of coping with the kinds of problems we have. But what we know from the same research is that if we shift our level of thinking and we go up a level to independent, and 25% of the population already have, from this level we're capable of breakthrough. From this level, I'm a human being, life happens, change happens, shit happens, and when it does, I think differently and work out a way through. 1% of the population, and these are our level 5 leaders, go to the next level. I know life happens, change happens, shit happens when it does. But I get some people together, just ordinary people like me. We get a big, hairy, audacious goal. We live the values. We go out and we change the world. Well, I'm here to tell you that we don't need 1% up there. We need 60, 70, 80% of people up there. And I can tell you because of my years and years and years of working in corporations, it is easy to do. The technology exists. However, most of our leaders are here. And because they're there, they're not looking. They're staying within the box. They're not looking for solutions. They're looking for socialised answers. And socialised answers are a bit of this and a bit of that and don't really touch me and don't make me think and don't make me be different and don't make me think outside the box. Even though it's bad for business. Even though the research shows us that if we go up those levels of thinking, we can enhance our environment. We can build community. We can have happy workplaces. And we can make more money. So what does all this mean? Well, CSR, Business Breakthrough and Planetary Survival, are intimately linked. Holistic systemic change starts with the leaders and to succeed, you must raise your level of thinking. I found a lot of this out by accident and I found it out by accident in the early 90s working with an amazing guy called David Judd. And I'll just share my story, his story with you before we end. So, um, in the early 90s, I went through a series of personal disasters. My marriage failed. My beautiful daughter um, developed a life-threatening disease and she had an arrest. And that meant that her heart stopped beating and she stopped breathing. And I suppose for about 20 minutes, I pumped her heart and breathed for her and Eventually the ambulance came and she got to hospital and they put her up, sort of spread-eagled on this board and put fibrillators on her and anyway, she breathed. And for about a year, we didn't know if she'd live or die. She needed 24-hour-a-day nursing and so I gave up work and stayed home to nurse her. At this same time, my father developed life-threatening cancer and came to live with me so I could nurse him until he died. So nursing my daughter and my father, looking after my son and having absolutely no income, meant that I accumulated a big debt. After a year, my father died in great peace and my daughter was well enough to go back to school and therefore I could go back to work. But what was I going to do? I didn't quite know. But somebody had asked me if I'd give a talk um, in Melbourne to a group of people on change and I was the first speaker after lunch and they'd had speaker after speaker after speaker and I thought I just can't get up and speak to them again, you know, they've all had lunch so I'll go to sleep. So I had all the chairs and the tables removed and got people to sit in groups and imagine each other as animals and then say, you know, why you thought that was that animal. So if someone looks at you and says, you know, you remind me of a snake, there's a message there, you know. <laughs> so people did this exercise and and the message was, you know, we think people pick up what we say. But in fact, they pick up who we are. Because these guys that actually hadn't met each other, really, they'd just been sitting listening to speakers all day, actually got huge impact and input and feedback, you know, really valid feedback from each other. And so people went away thinking about that. And in the afternoon tea, these two guys in overalls, one of whom is now Wayne Osborne, the 
managing director of Alcoa, but he wasn't then. Back then he was a guy in overalls. Came up and said, our boss needs you. He's our biggest problem and our greatest asset. Well, I've got to tell you, at this stage in my career, I'd smile sweetly and walk away. But back then, I was so poor, I needed their boss far more than he needed me. So before I knew it, I was on an aeroplane flying to Portland Aluminium. And Portland is a town, back then it was about 10,000 people in southwest Victoria. And I spent the day talking to the guys on the top team of Portland, getting ready to meet the boss, David, in the afternoon. And during those interviews, I found out quite a few things. I found out that David was suffering from life-threatening cancer and that he had, in fact, just had a brain tumour removed and that, uh, that sorry, <laughs> I'm getting my five minutes, so I've got to be distracted. Uh, he'd just had a brain tumour removed um, and that his energy levels went down during the day. I learned that he was a man of great vision, huge vision, but also that he had a ferocious temper. He used to go into the plant and he'd do that on a machine and if there was any dust, he'd say, Sam! Sam! And people were terrified of this man. People were dying all over the plant of industrial asthma because if anyone put on their safety gear, he'd call them a bloody wuss. So um, I went, you know, and I, so I get learning more and more about David. And what I heard was as his energy levels went down during the day, his anger went up. I found out I was his last appointment of the day. <laughs> and I found out he hated consulting. But I told you I was desperate, huh? So I went in and I met David and he was six foot two, very thin limbs, but his big gut, which was the cancer that was killing him. And he kind of hovered over his desk, not quite sitting and not quite standing. And I was later told that's what he did when he really hated people and he wanted them to go away. But desperation is an amazing thing. And in that one hour, and to this day I don't know how I did it, in that one hour I convinced David that he and I and 17 of his direct reports would get in aluminium dinghies in the middle of Australia in a place called Inaminka. We would boat down the flood waters of Cooper Creek, which floods once every 50 years, into Lake Eyre. We'd be gone for 10 days and it would be called a leadership development program. And that's exactly what we did. That smelter was a greenfield site. It had been built from the ground up. The guys that had built it had been working seven days a week, often 24 hours a day. They were stressed out of their heads. Their relationships were in bad shape. And they'd actually found out once they got to make aluminium, it was pretty boring compared to actually building a smelter. So what happened down Cooper Creek? Well, going back to those four quadrants, people really got in touch with who they were. So I'm talking about basic childhood stuff. You know, How did I get to be who I was? How did I form my beliefs? Are they still serving me? Is there a better way for me to operate in the world? What's happening in my relationships at home and at work but also with the people right here? And how can I change that? How can I work on that? They link that into their behaviours and their skills. But they also got themselves a strategic vision. They decided that they would become the best aluminium smelter in the world. They went back from that trip and they did a whole range of things and they did so many I need to read it to you because I often forget to leave one out. They put the entire township of Portland, some 10,000 people, through a personal development program. They started the Portland Speakers Circuit and had people like Don Burroughs, and, uh, sorry, David Suzuki, they also had Don Burroughs, come into town to speak to the local people to expand their, think to expand their thinking, get them to think in different ways, get them out of the box in their thinking. They actually started a rehabilitation program for street kids and they didn't sort of pay someone to go and do it. They bought, the people from the smelters bought houses and they went and lived in the houses with the street kids and taught them to use knives and forks and have a shower and fill out forms and all that sort of stuff. They built a gym, a creche, a medical centre. The members of the, of the top team went on the boards of the local schools, cultural centres, sporting associations. They sponsored the reenactment of local historical events. They turned the whole environment around the smelter into smelter in the park. And again, they didn't pay someone to do it. The people from the smelter went out and worked in the environment and created these amazing natural wetlands. They won three World Heritage Awards for that. 
In the business area, technical and social innovation became world class. People were coming in from all around the world to see what they were doing. The rates of industrial injury, staff turnover and absenteeism were radically reduced, as was industrial waste. In 1992, Portland Aluminium Smelter, that's about 18 months after we started, Portland Aluminium Smelter was named the world benchmark culture for an aluminium smelter. In 1993, David was the first Australian to be named by Industry Week as an unsung hero of industry. In August that same year, David died and that day I was um, supposed to be running a workshop with the top team of VP and I rang up and I said, look, I'm sorry, I can't come. I have a funeral to attend and I wasn't the only person. The Aluminium Company of America had hired two planes and they'd flown people in from all around the world to say goodbye to this amazing man. And One of the things I forgot to tell you, one of the other things they did was they got Don Burroughs when he came to town to teach all the local kids to play jazz. So as we filed into the church, of course in the foyer, all the local kids with Don Burroughs conducting them playing all David's favourite songs. And then we went into the church and people after people told us how one man, one man, by deciding to change his way of operating, opening up his mind and level of thinking, working on his relationships, had taken with him not just a team, not just a smelter, not just a township, but a whole global company. It was just the most phenomenal thing. And then as the funeral procession wound through the town to the graveyard, the 10,000 people of Portland stood in the streets to say goodbye to this amazing man. And I just want to read you um, what David wrote in the preface to my first book. It is obvious to me now, it wasn't for many years, that the first individual that we need to work with is ourselves. As managers, we've been exhorting others to change. But at the same time, we've been fearful of letting go of our old ways on which we've based our authority, influence and self-esteem. If we are to be successful in the future, those old ways have to go because they are holding others back from realising their full potential. Admitting that we are the ones creating the blockage is the first step and the most difficult. I think David is a wonderful example of corporate social responsibility. He worked on himself. He built everything that he did into the business. He took all the communities along with him. When I was first asked to go to Portland, one of the main problems was they couldn't get anyone to stay there. Several years later, I received a call from Pittsburgh, which at the time was the home of Alcoa, to complain they couldn't get anyone to leave. Corporate social responsibility is essential. We need our planet to survive. To do that, we all have to work together. And the place we all have to start is with ourselves. Thank you. Would you like to handle your own question, Q&A? I am very happy to. Good. Okay, are there any questions? Thanks, Margaret. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, Lisa Cotton from Social Ventures Australia. I'm interested to know what happened at that first leadership retreat that was so profound that it created such transformation in that company. Which one? The first one on the river. Oh, the, on day, oh that one. What happened? Well, everyone cried. Um, what happened? It's a long time ago. Um, I guess... Uh, Basically, we did things called I statements and I statements are uh, a thought statement, a feeling statement, an action statement. So, um, everyone spoke a lot. We did a lot of I statements. Um, I devised a, a, a sort of a questionnaire where people needed to get feedback from each other. 
Um, we meditated every day. Um, we lived together, <laughs> which was pretty amazing. I mean, the first night out, we were on these aluminium dinghies, right? This is a, this is a big deal. Like we're in the middle of nowhere. They, we got a, a, a there's a Alcoa have this um, policy that no two uh, executives, no more than two executives, can go on the same aeroplane in case it crashes. Well, all 17 of them went on the aeroplane with me and we were flown into Inaminka and then the plane took off, right? So we're in the middle of nowhere. We're stuck. So there's nowhere to go. And we get on the boats on the flood water and we go down looking for the first night place to sleep and we can't find anywhere. So the first night we're sleeping on mud flats, no tent, no nothing, you know. And, I mean, this was kind of pretty amazing conditions. They decided not to drink for the 10 days. I mean, generally they drank a lot and they decided it would be dry. Um, and there was a lot in just the conditions, you know. And I guess, you know, one of my trainings is as a psychotherapist. So, you know, kind of the questions that I would ask the group perhaps would go a lot deeper than normal. People looked at their belief systems and their childhood and who they were and how they got to where they are and the impact that was having on what they wanted to be and where they wanted to go in the world. Um, and I got them to do a lot of visioning and working with symbols, you know, so what is the symbol of who we want to be? So that takes people out of their normal thinking and gets them to think in, in much bigger ways. Um, but there's also the whole spiritual aspect of being in the wilderness. I mean, for 10 days we're in the wilderness and even the most cynical person has to be touched by that. You know, when we did actually get to have tents, which was kind of nice, you'd wake up in the morning and there'd be little paw prints, you know, and you kind of know that maybe a dingo had visited or it was just... It was just the most astounding place to be, being in the, the wilderness. It kind of made us all realise who were we and what mattered and, and just the warmth of being with each other. I've got to say it transformed me. I don't know about them. <laughs> Hi, Margaret. Uh, Kerry on with us, uh, Sustainable Futures magazine. Um, you're obviously a, a brilliant change agent on the personal level to get such profound change um, through individuals uh, in such a short time. But I'm amazed at the impact of change and the depth of achievement um, and action that's gone into place and, and manifested in such short times. So I was talking about the 18-month change with Alcoa. What is, can you give us some indication of some of the tools that you use yeah. to get... Um, change grounded so incredibly quickly with such large-scale projects? Mm. Um, well, the, the first is simply not allowing people to think small. So um, I, I now have a, a company and I employ a lot of people and we all do the same, you know. It's like how do you not let people think small? Thinking small, so normal now becomes thinking big. So independent and integral thinking, you normalise it and that's what's normal. Because what happens in most organisations is socialised is normal. Thinking small is normal. So that anyone thinks big and they're kind of the odd man out and they're pushed out. So what we have is around the world, that 25% of independent thinkers who we so desperately need, where are they going? Into their own businesses or into not-for-profits because they feel there is no place for them in organisation. So we go into organisations and we find that 25% of people think like that. So you find and support and normalise that 25%. Then you say to the others, hey guys, you're going to have to lift your game. <laughs> Think and small don't work anymore. Then you link it into results. So everybody has to have a breakthrough project and they have to achieve. They have to be measured against their breakthrough project and these breakthrough projects have to be big, hairy, audacious goals. So if it's not a big, hairy, audacious goal, you don't have to think big to get it. You can be, still think small. So the only way you can achieve the goal is to think big. And you have to do that in relationships so you're working all the time with people's relationships so that their relationships are growing and developing around the strategy of the business while they're developing it and working it with each other as human beings to develop on a spiritual, emotional level. So you just have to do it all simultaneously and once you've got the top team on site, that's the hard bit, the hard bit is getting the leaders, but once you've got the leaders on site, it just happens. It becomes, I mean, <laughs> Craig once said to me, he said, Margaret, this is a terrible thing, but what you do is a bit like a virus. It's catching. Because once it starts, people just don't want it any other way. And the results are pretty reinforcing. <laughs> you get those kind of results when people... I mean, one of... just I, I think they wanted me to move on, but one of the things that happened in, um, in Zinefex is there was one smelter that really took this stuff on early and one that was a bit of a block. 
And it just so happened they had the same problem. And the smelter that took this on went and they worked in all the ways that we taught them to do and they solved the problem pretty much for free, you know, maybe a few thousand dollars. The other smelter solved it in the traditional way. It cost them $70 million. That was a wake-up call, yeah? It's like, okay, what did you guys do? <laughs> so, it, you know, as it works, it reinforces. Sorry, Margot. Um, Ron Kruger from ABL State Chamber. I'm, I'm in media, so I constantly bombard you guys with a lot of, I think you call it crap. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, you talk about CSR and you make uh, references to large corporations. I work largely with small to medium-sized enterprises. Um, they are essentially preoccupied with the bottom line. They cannot, many of them, think beyond that because of the compliance, the red tape, the over-regulation so on and so forth, we hear about it often. Um, I imagine you could uh, apply many of the principles of uh, CSR to also the small to medium sized business environment, let alone the corporation. Yeah, well uh, we don't work with small to medium enterprise but we are a small to medium enterprise yeah. and absolutely everything that we sell and do to our clients, we sell and do to ourselves. And I can't say that it's easy, people squawk and think we're a bit nutty sometimes but once people come and are in cult, you know, into our culture and actually are acculturated, again, they just don't want to go anywhere else. So um, <laughs> I have to say that my leadership team put me up against a wall the other day and said, no more pro bono. Like, <laughs> we've got to actually get paid sometimes um, because it's just so much part of who we are and what we do that I got a bit carried away, so I had to be pulled back. But that hasn't stopped us growing at, I don't know, Mary, what are we growing at? About 100% and making 40%... Um, EBIT. We're a pretty successful little company and we're getting to be a pretty successful mid-sized company. And I imagine a lot of the... By living what we teach. I imagine a lot of the larger companies are also in order... Well, they're, they're, they're basically enforcing some of these CR principles down the line to their suppliers, uh, to the smaller businesses that they're outsourcing some of the functions to as well. They're saying, you know, if you want to do business with us, then you have to do it in such a particular way. Well, we see what I'd argue is that they're enforcing compliance and there's a very big difference between what I'm saying and compliance. All the companies I work with don't even worry about compliance because they exceed it. What they're actually thinking about is how do we live a different way? How do we think a different way? Because when you live and think a different way, you just go so past anything that you would be complied to do it's ridiculous. So what they're enforcing is in fact small thinking rather than solving the problem. I think they want me to move on, is it? Do you want me to move on now? One more question. Okay. Yep. Hi, uh, Richard Milroy from Ethical Investor Magazine. I just want to comment on what that gentleman just said about small companies always being obsessed with the bottom line. I run a small company and I ran a small company before that became a medium-sized company and that was never the case for me <laughs> and I think successful cafes or any small company always have something else in mind other than just profit and if they don't they do tend to run into problems over the long term. That's yeah. my personal view which I, you know, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Um, my question though is something else. For the stuff you've been talking about to me seems to be about culture and transformational change. It is transformational, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, about CSR specifically. Did, did you have any measurements of CSR performance that <laughs> these changes were measured against? Um, well, <laughs> the answer is yes and no. Uh, uh, the problem with one of our marketing problems is that we never go and measure these things. But whenever we're asked to, like sometimes we might be asked to say do some um, equal opportunity work in a company and they say, are you any good at that? And so we'll go back and we'll look at our clients and we'll say, you know, did anything around equal opportunity happen because of what we did? And in every case, they've won awards, <laughs> right? So if we go and we say, what about corporate social responsibility? We'll go back and we'll look and in every case, they've won awards and exceeded the benefits. But so I, say, I, know I want to answer this because what I'm saying is what we tend to do is we break things up into bits and we go, this is CSR and this is um, equal opportunity and this is business and this is strategy and this is... And what I'm saying is when you move to these higher levels of thinking, you don't think that way. You just think... How can we exceed everything? 
How can we break all the limits? How can we be excellent on every measure? But you still presumably have goals and well, in, well, in a way you do. Something. You have big, hairy, audacious goals. Okay, and so the big, hairy, audacious goals to know are... whether or not you've reached them or not. Well, yes, but they sort of become... It's not, that, it's not that they're not important, but what I'm saying is the measures that we normally look at become irrelevant because you've transformed your world and moved so far past it. And that happens in every case. So, yes, they can go back and you can look, for example, at the safety record and you can look at the environmental pollution record and you can look at what's happening in community record and you can look at what's happening with women record and you can look at what's happening in minority record and in every case they're exceeded. Because what we've been taught to think in that in-the-box thinking, that 75% thinking, is that it's either or in bits. And when we move to that other level, you can do it all quickly, simultaneously and have fun and make more money. It's such a wonderful message. <laughs> that 75% of the population go, nah, nah. Yeah, why? <laughs> there has never been a better time in history to do this stuff. On that note, <laughs> thank you very much, Margaret. <laughs> There's never been a better time in history and a greater need to do something to change. Thank you, Margaret, once again. That was terrific. What we're going to do is get, um, get to know each other very briefly over the next five minutes at our tables. I'd like you to just um, share with others your thoughts from this presentation, what insights you had, what, what, how did it impact you, maybe in one sentence at a time rather than a a diatribe because we won't have time. So you've got five minutes and this is going to be a challenge for self-managing tables <laughs> because, uh, you know, and I know there's some women in the room who can handle more than one thing at a time so I'm relying on you to actually do the following. What I'd like to do is before you start, attention please, before you start there's something very important. We're going to have tea in five minutes, tea break in five minutes. So you you really uh, need, when it comes to the tea break, to, to go for your tea break in tables and watch the others move and don't crowd the whole corner over there. But I'll announce that again. You have five minutes now to incite each other. <laughs>